I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from each and every one of us, Ya Rabb, Ameen, Ameen, to reward each and every one of you, Ya Rabb, Ameen, Ameen, and to keep us upon that which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabb, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Um, it's so good to see the masjid busy, full, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the effort of each and every one of us, Ya Rabb, Ameen. As you know, we're approaching Maghrib on a Jum'ah, last Jum'ah, of Ramadan on a 27th yani night. So this is one of the best times, inshallah, to be making dua in the whole year. One of the best times to be making dua in the whole year. So what I'll do, inshallah, is I'll keep the reminder brief, inshallah, and concise, uh, following the recitation. And then after that, inshallah, we'll close with a dua asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept. <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر إلى الذي حج إبراهيم في ربه أن آتاه الله الملك إذ قال إبراهيم ربي الذي يحيي ويميت قال أنا أحيي وأميت قال إبراهيم فإن الله يأتي بالشمس من المشرق فأت بها فأت بها من المغرب فبهت الذي كفر والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين أو كالذي مر على قرية وهي خاوية على عروشها قال قال أنا يحيي هذه الله بعد موتها فأماته الله مئة عام ثم بعثه قال كم لبثت قال لبثت يوما أو بعض يوم قال بل لبثت مئة عام فانظر إلى طعامك وشرابك لم يتسن فانظر إلى طعامك وشرابك لم يتسنه وانظر إلى حمارك ولنجعلك آية للناس وانظر إلى العظام كيف ننشزها ثم نكسوها لحما فلما تبين له قال أعلم أن الله على كل شيء قدير وإذ قال إبراهيم رب أرني كيف تحيي الموتى قال أولم تؤمن قال بلى قال بلى ولكن ليطمئن قلبي قال فخذ أربعة من الطير فصرهن إليك ثم اجعل على كل جبل منهن جزءا ثم ادعهن يأتينك سعيا واعلم أن الله عزيز حكيم مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبة كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل في كل سنبلة في كل سنبلة مئة حبة والله يضاعف لمن يشاء والله واسع عليم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا It is again good to see everybody I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us sincere and accepts our fasting, our prayer, our charity, our zakah and our dua Ya Rabb Ameen 
And may Allah give peace and uh, safety and victory and justice and liberation and freedom and autonomy to the people of Palestine, Ya Rabbi Ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring an end to this genocide and end to this injustice and an end to this occupation and colonialism and dispossession and displacement, Ya Rabbi. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. My brothers and my sisters, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of life. We know that He is the one that allows also for death to take place. No one leaves this world, no one enters this world except through His knowledge and except through His permission. And sometimes what happens, subhanAllah, is some of us, we lose sight of that. And some of us don't just lose sight of it. Some of us begin to attribute, subhanAllah, those agencies, you know, life and death, uh, to other factors besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here's a story of someone who became so unjust, a king, that thought, subhanAllah, he possessed the right and the ability to give life and to cause death. So look at this story. Alam tara ila ladhi hajja Ibrahim fi rabbihi. Imagine Ibrahim is standing in front of this king. And this king is having a debate with Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's telling him, okay, so tell me, what do you believe in? What do you believe in? Who is this God that you believe in? Right? Who is this God that gave you prophethood and messengerhood? So what did Ibrahim say? He said that my Lord is the one that gives life and the one that causes life to cease to exist. So what does he say? This king says, no. أَنَا أُحْيِي umit." Right? أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى لِذِي حَاجَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ فِي رَبِّهِ أَنْ أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ إِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّيَ الَّذِي يُحْيُوا يَمِيت My Lord is the one who gives life and causes death. He says, no, I'm the one who causes life and, 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 and causes death. It's me. So imagine Ibrahim could have asked him, what do you mean? Like, I could have argued further, but he just lets it be. He lets this argument over. And then the king doesn't like that. He's like, let me explain. I'm the one who causes life and I'm the one who brings life to an end. Look at these two inmates. Look at these two prisoners. I can choose to give one of them a life sentence and I can choose to spare their life. So I've given them life. And I can take one of them and I can, what? And I can give them a death sentence and ask for them to be executed and it will happen. So I'm the one who controls the fate of human lives. Therefore, I cause life and I cause life to exist or to cease to exist. Now this is the problem, subhanAllah, with many of the people that we have that grow too comfortable in their power. They grow too comfortable in their position. They grow too comfortable in their seat. They begin to attribute even divine agencies to themselves. They begin to attribute divine powers, subhanAllah. Thank you, Jazakallah khair. They begin to attribute divine powers to themselves. May Allah give you from the food of Jannah, ya Rabbi Ameen. Say Ameen. And so here, Ibrahim goes on. He lets this argument end. And he asks then, well, my Lord is the one who brings what? فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ فَأْتِي بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ My Lord is the one that brings the sun out of the east, rising, so you allow it to come out of the west. فَأْتِي بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي كَفَرِ At that moment, he had nothing to say. The conversation was over. And in that, we learned so many lessons. Number one, sometimes you don't have to address a nonsensical argument. Just move on to the next one. And two, sometimes even when you're speaking to a person of arrogance, don't lash out. Even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa, when he's speaking to Fir'aun, what does he say? فَقُولَ لَهُ To Musa and Harun, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرْ أَوْ يَخْشَى Speak to him gently. Perhaps he may remember. Perhaps he may have what? He may soft it up. He may come to realize. He may come to have a moment of awareness, a moment of honesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here we learn one of the main important lessons in that we don't shut the door in calling anybody to Islam, calling anybody towards goodness. We don't shut any door. And in the way that we call, we should remain gentle. And in the way that we address and have these conversations, if an argument comes our way, <coughs> excuse me, that is nonsensical, don't, you know, don't, don't keep going back and forth. Avoid it. Don't argue too much. Subhanallah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us, I guarantee a house in the best part of Jannah for the one who leaves an argument even if they're right. Every time you leave an argument and move on to something more constructive, something more decisive, something, subhanallah, more clear, right? 
It's as if you've just secured yourself one of the best spots in Jannah, one of the best real states of Jannah. Imagine how much we would give to get a good house with a good sea view, good property, good size. You know, we do a lot, subhanAllah, good lot size. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's generosity is you get that every single time that you have an argument in front of you and you decide to walk away from it and focus on that which is what? Which is more constructive. It doesn't mean that you're going to let the conversation end. No, Ibrahim moves on to articulate his point. You think you're the one that's going to cause life and, 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 and seize it to exist or cause it to exist, right? Prove it. Show me what, what's going to happen. People are going to die. Why would you even entertain that? Let's move on to another argument. Let's talk about that which you cannot control, right? The sun. You say that you're in control of that which is natural. You control of that which is life. Here's another entity. Let's see if he can, you know, reverse that course. And of course, he cannot. Argument is over. Now, this conversation left Ibrahim wondering, left Ibrahim curious because the question of life and death. So he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحِي الْمَوْتَى Ibrahim then asks Allah, Ya Allah, show me, show me how you are able to Bring the dead back to life. Now here's something very important. He doesn't say, prove to me that you can bring the dead back to life. He, it's not a question of faith. Because Ibrahim is a prophet, a messenger. When a Nabi وسلم, is narrating this to the companions, he said, we are more likely, we, are, we have a much higher chance of having doubt and suspicion than who? Than Ibrahim. And if we don't have, if you know me to not be a person of doubt or suspicion, then Ibrahim is much, much higher in our regard and much, much more likely to have conviction and much, much more likely to be out of the fold of doubt and confusion. He has a very special relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this phase. Not to say that we can't ask questions, you know. When Ibrahim goes through that phase where he looks up, you know, هذا Rabbi, هذا Akbar, is it the moon, is it the star, is it the sun? When he's going to find his Lord, looking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a big question in tafsir. هل هو ناظر أم مناظر? Is he looking or is he making a point? Is he looking for answers or is he making a point? And many of the Mufassirun say that he was actually making a point. He's saying, well, you worship entities besides Allah. Well, look at this thing. Well, it sets. It has limits. Anything that rises will also set, which means it's not in itself uh, autonomous. It doesn't have control over its own reality. It's bound by other things. It's bound by gravitational forces. It's bound by other forces. So that can be Allah. Let's look at that which is bigger, that which is brighter. But all of it, again, is bound and limited and contingent. So he makes a point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Is unlimited, not dependent on anything else, not contingent on anything else. He's the one that everyone needs, but he's the one that needs no one. However, some of the Mufassirun say this is early on in the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and he was genuinely looking. He was nadir. And I believe among the subhanAllah, some of the early Mufassirin, including subhanAllah, um, al al Imam al Qurtubi and others as well, right? Al Imam al Qurtubi and others as well make this point that he was actually looking for truth and he was looking for answers. And he's looking through the world and everything that exists trying to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the answers and gives him what? Gives him that conviction. Now he's in a state, listen to this carefully, he's in a state where he wants to know how close he is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How likely he is to receive that intimate knowledge. So he's not asking, can you, Ya Allah, give rise to that which has died? I know I believe with full conviction that you can. But the question is, how? How? And now this is an amazing question because the question that only a prophet can ask. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Only a prophet can ask because only a prophet has that level of intimacy and awareness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's trying to figure out, some of the Mufassirun say, how close he is to Allah. How much is Allah going to show him? How much of the unseen is he going to have access to? So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ Do you not have that conviction already? He says, of course I do. Bala, absolutely. 
ولكن ليطمئن قلبي but I want that curiosity in my heart to be reached I want that peace in my heart to be actualized I have no doubt that you can but I'm curious as to how so what does Allah say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says take فخذ أربعة من الطير فصرهن إليك ثم اجعل على كل جبل منهن جزءا take these different four different types of birds and subhanallah you know cut them into pieces put them on different parts of mountains right very far away scattered ثم ادعهن and then call them to you they will come back to life now what's interesting Allah doesn't say they will come back flying to you is yatunaka sa'ya they will come back directly approaching you sa'ya with that goal in mind actually sa'ya means what to to walk with pace with purpose so they will walk back to you now why does allah say that they will walk back to you there's a lot of precise language here cuz imagine if they fly back in the sky your mind can say oh you know what how do i know it's the same birds they were at different parts of the mountains and you're saying birds just flew out no these these birds that you yourself with your own hand divide into smaller pieces and place them on different parts of the mountains call them back through the command of allah and the will of allah and they will walk back towards you the same birds not only will they come back to life not only will they fly again through the command of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they will walk towards you now what's interesting some of the mufassirun say that this was sufficient ibrahim didn't need anything else he didn't ask anything else when allah told him how that if you were to take some birds and do this that this would actually happen he believed he understood the how and he didn't have to actually cut the birds and place them on the mountain or do any of that the hearing the how was sufficient for him to believe they didn't actually have to implement imagine the, you believe in the experiment so well that khalas this that you done i don't even need to verify i don't i don't need to empirically test it you said it it's done i needed to just know how you've explained how it's possible end of discussion my imagination is satisfied my curiosity is satisfied and that's it done other mufassirun say that he actually implemented it and subhanallah this did take place now this is one of the miracles of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from this we learn many many lessons among the lessons that we learn number 1 is that yes there are certain parts of the ghaib that are what that are unaccessible to any of us however through dua through commitment to allah through devotion to allah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give certain people intimate knowledge through dreams through inspiration and so it's not it's not what it's not bad to turn to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ya allah guide me in understanding this further Ya Allah, guide me in understanding this ayah further. Ya Allah, deepen my understanding of this concept. Ya Allah, I'm struggling with this. Allow me to see it better, to understand it better, to actualize it better, to grasp it better. As long as it's not matters of the ghaib that are beyond, right? Beyond the capacity of our humanity, limited humanity, within our capacity. But of course, the prophets and the messengers, they had these special privileges with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this is the story of Ibrahim and the story of resurrection. closer to home closer to home i wanted to finish up by looking at the ayah in the quran which is very beautiful allah says in surah al-anfal ya ayyuha alladhina amanu istajibu lillahi wa lirrasul idha da'akum lima yuhyikum turn to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hear the call of allah and the call of his messenger when they call you when allah calls you on behalf of uh, when the messenger of allah calls you on behalf of allah to that which brings you life to that which will revive your soul revive your body what is it that will bring us life what is it that will revive our soul revive our body this quran so imagine allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that it's this quran that will give life to the human being that will give life to the soul of the human being to the body of the human being and how desperate in need we are of that revival look at subhanallah my brothers and my sisters this month of ramadan You think about how much we actually ate? We ate very little, very little. If you're supposed to, and some of us yani Ramadan we feast. Right? Yani the, the ones who are fasting properly, huh? Uh, I know some of the brothers were trying to invite me for suhoor. We're going for suhoor inshallah, we're going to eat butter, chicken and biryani and nihari and 
uh, Habibi, what kind of suhoor is this? Yani, <laughs> you're planning on sleeping till 2 p.m. Yeah, and then you, you go to sleep uh, at Fajr, you wake up at 2, 3 p.m., you fast four hours, like, mashallah, Ramadan was so easy. <laughs> of course, it was so easy, right? But if you're doing it properly, if you're doing it properly, right, you would have little food, little water, yet you're full of energy, you're full of life. I know some of you have experienced this more productivity in Ramadan than outside of Ramadan. You know, some people, they say, I don't know, the, the Muslim ummah, what a, what a shame. For 30 days, they're working less hours, they're less productive. But wallahi, that's not the case. There's a lot of mental clarity and a lot of ideas and creativity that, is, that are generated in Ramadan. There's a lot of productivity in Ramadan. Because subhanAllah, when you are connected to the Quran, you're connected to a deeper source of energy, to a deeper source of life, to a deeper source of rejuvenation. And that is the direct word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that gives us that excitement, that gives us that clarity, and gives us that grounding. So when we talk about life and death, don't forget that Allah in Surah Al-Rahman, when He mentions Ar-Rahman, Allam Al-Quran, Khalaq Al-Insan, Allamahu Al-Bayan. Before talking about the creation of the human, the gift of life, and Allah is talking about the Rahmah, the way that He manifests His mercy to us, before the gift of humanity, the gift of life, He mentions what? Ar-Rahman, Allam Al-Quran. He taught the Quran. Because that is a greater gift than the gift of life itself. If Allah gives you the gift of the Quran, then you have what? Then you have life. You have purpose. You have clarity. You know why you're here. You know what you're going for. You know where you're, you have a vision. You have a vision. You have a mission. You know, there are corporations, companies that will pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to figure out what is our mission? What is our vision? We need to pin it down. We need to get very, very specific. But the Quran gives you a mission, a vision, gives you roadmaps, examples of people who did it before. You want to know how to overcome trauma? Look at the story of Yusuf. You want to know what resilience looks like? Look at the story of Ibrahim. You want to know what it's like to speak to an unjust power and not give up? And what you have to do to overcome the propaganda? Look at the story of Musa alayhi salam. You want to know what cooperation and collaboration should look like between people that are going for the same goal? Look at the relationship that Musa has with Harun. You want to know what goes wrong with believing communities? The, the things that they fall into, the traps of shaitan, the things that they're likely to misunderstand and get confused about? Look at the story of Banu Israel. You want to know what patience looks like? How to overcome losing your children, look at losing your business, losing everything that you have, losing your family, losing your health? Look at the story of Ayub. You want to know how to overcome, subhanAllah, from losing your loved one or being separate from your loved one? Bereavement? Look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Look at, subhanAllah, Yaqub alayhi salam. And you want to know then the specific details, you know, yeah, but these are very general stories. You want to know then the specific details of how to eat, how to walk, how to sleep, how to navigate your marriage, how to navigate a potential divorce, how to overcome difficulties, how to survive the loss of a loved ones, how to build a community, how to create brotherhood between that community, how to motivate people to, to be true believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the lived experience of the Quran, the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Like what else do you want? What else do we need? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, right, there are communities that will say, right, if only we had guidance, we would have not made the mistakes of the people of the past. If only we had clear, clear instructions, then we'd know what to do. If only we had clear mandates, then we would have a chance at doing better than the ones that have come before. Allah says what? All that you've asked for has been given to you through this Quran and through the lived experience of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this, in this Ramadan, we have built that connection with the Quran. Let's not lose that connection after Ramadan. Let's not be what? Let's not be from those who worship Ramadan. Let's be from those who worship Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Let's not be from those who are seasonal Muslims, right? So, seasonal Muslims. We have the Jum'ani Muslims, the Idani Muslims, right? We have the Laylat Al-Qadr Muslims. Alhamdulillah, they're all Muslims. And many of them might be better than, than, than many of us. We're not looking down upon them. But we're also saying that we can do better. Rather than being part-time Muslims, we should what? 
kaf. Ya ayuha ladina amanu. Udhulu fi silmi kaf. Allah speaking to the believers. O you who believe, enter into Islam, enter into this submission, enter into this covenant with Allah, enter into this peace fully, wholeheartedly. So Allah is speaking to believers and He's saying, you can be a believer, yet there could be parts of Islam that you have not embraced fully. And that's why one of the du'as that we should all be making tonight, my brothers and my sisters, as we're making du'a for Palestine and the people of Palestine, one du'a that we should all be making tonight, Ya Allah, allow me to worship you in the way that you deserve to be worshipped, not in the way that I think you should be worshipped. Ya Allah, allow me to love you in the way that you deserve to be loved, not in the way that I'm capable of love, because my capacity may be limited. And Ya Allah, allow my understanding of you, my relationship with you, to not be limited by my prejudices, by my biases, by my blind spots, but to be guided by your generosity, to be guided by your rahmah, and to be guided by your grace. Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen. And as we talk about life, my brothers and my sisters, you know, to read the Qur'an, I, wallahi, it's, it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's very important that we have a, a connection with the Qur'an because it's the thing that will evoke life, true life in your heart. It will give you barakah and everything else. It will give you healing in, in any aspect of your life. It will give you that guidance in your life. It will give you that rahmah. But sometimes, listen to this carefully, sometimes it's difficult to connect with the Qur'an if you haven't connected with the Messenger It's much easier when you see the Messenger, the, the stories of the Prophet when you see what guidance looks like, when you see what generosity looks like, when you see what, uh, what, what uh, discipline, what honesty looks like, and then you have these ideas, these stories in your mind. Then when you open the Quran and you know the people of honest, you know what that looks like. The people of integrity, you know what that looks like. Right? You know what that looks like. So I'm encouraging each and every one of you, one of the things that you should take away, inshallah, from Ramadan as a goal after Ramadan is try to learn intimately the story of the Prophet, وسلم, especially his manners. His manners. Wallahi, one story from the Prophet ﷺ could be enough to change our hearts and to bring, to resurrect the dead that we have, unfortunately. The dust that we have accumulated in our hearts, through our, subhanAllah, through our hearts, through the sins that, that we, 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 we fall into. One story from the Prophet ﷺ, one gentle story, one story that shows that discipline and clarity can un, yani undo years, years of lust, that has subhanAllah built over our heart, envy and jealousy and hatred that has built on our heart. And I want to finish with some of these stories. And this is what we're going to be continuing, inshaAllah, tonight uh, at midnight, 12, 12, 30, inshaAllah. We're going to be continuing this theme and looking at more of these stories with the Prophet Wasallam. But for now, I want you to imagine, you want to see what honesty looks like of a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sees a mother calling her daughter calling her child. And what does she do? She closes her hand like this. And she says, come, come, come. I have something for you. You know when we're struggling in public to get our children's attention? Sometimes we resort to bribery, right? Habibti, come. Don't embarrass me in front of people. I have something for you. I have candy, your favorite. So what did the Nabi Wasallam say to her? Gently. He said to her, do you really have something in your, heart, in your hand? She said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, good. Because in a case where you don't, that would be considered a lie in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That would be considered a lie in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine he's teaching her at this time to build a secure attachment with her daughter, with our children, so that our words mean something to them. You know the typical example, subhanAllah, that I give. You're at home and the phone is ringing. And then Abdullah, your young Abdullah, he's like four years old, five years old. Mama, Baba... Ammu Ahmed is calling, he's saying, uh, he wants to talk to you. Tell him I'm not here. Baba says he's not here, huh? Right? And then, and then what happens, our kids grow up, our children grow up seeing this discrepancy, seeing this inconsistency. And then they hit teenagehood, they have their identity crisis, and they're having a difficult time to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you bring them to the masjid, please use your magic wand, yani. Fix them, guide them, put the Quran into their heart. You know, fix my daughter, fix my son. 
But how can you undo? Not always the case. Sometimes you've done the best that you can. It's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't guide whomever you love, but Allah guides whomever He wills. But many times, the spiritual crisis that our children go through are actually symptoms of deeper trust issues that they've developed because of our lack of consistency. When you see the consistency that the Prophet ﷺ embodied and the genuineness that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ embodied, it will allow you to trust, to trust this man and to trust what he has received and to trust the Qur'an and that trust is what will unlock a new deeper level of attachment and commitment to the Qur'an. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of us, Ya Rabbi Ameen, as people who fasted genuinely, prayed genuinely and sincerely. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a beautiful connection with the Qur'an, Ya Rabbi Ameen. Allah taqabbal minna, Ya Rabbi Ameen. With that, inshallah, we'll close off with a dua as we approach the best time to make that dua, inshallah. Allahumma taqabbal minna siyamana wa salatana wa qiyamana wa ruku'ana wa sujoodana wa zakatina wa dua'ana wa khtim lana bil baqiyati salihati a'malana Allahumma ahdi shababana wa nisaana wa rijalana واغفر لوالدينا وارحمهم كما ربونا صغارا اللهم اهدنا واهد بنا واجعلنا سبلا لمن اهتدى اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا واسرافنا في امرنا وثبت اقدامنا وانصرنا على من عادانا اللهم اجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا وجلاء أحزاننا وذهاب همومنا وغمومنا اللهم ذكرنا من القرآن ما نسينا وعلمنا من القرآن ما جهلنا وارزقنا تلاوة القرآن آناء الليل وأطراف النهار على الوجه الذي يرضيك عنا اللهم انصر المستضعفين في فلسطين اللهم انصر المستضعفين في فلسطين اللهم انصر المستضعفين في غزة اللهم انصرهم نصرا عاجلا يا كريم اللهم انصرهم نصرا عاجلا يا رب العالمين اللهم انصرهم على من ظلمهم وعلى من عاداهم اللهم اشف مرضاهم وداوي جرحاهم وعاف مبتلاهم وتقبل شهداءهم اللهم اغفر لموتاهم اللهم اغفر لهم وارحمهم وعافهم وعف عنهم ووسع مدخلهم ونقهم من الذنوب والخطايا كما ينقى الثوب الأبيض من الدنس اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا 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 اللهم يمن كتابنا ويسر حسابنا واستر عيوبنا واسترنا فوق الأرض وتحت الأرض ويوم العرض عليك اللهم ارزقنا الفردوس الأعلى بدون حساب أو سابقة عذاب فإنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم يا رب الناس أذهب البأس واشف أنت الشافي لا شفاء إلا شفاءك شفاء لا يغادر سقما يا رب العالمين اللهم اشف يا رب اللهم اشف يا رب مرضى المسلمين 
اللهم اغفر لموت المسلمين اللهم لا تدع لنا في جمعنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا طالبا إلا أعطيته ولا تلميذا إلا نجحته اللهم لا تدع لنا في جمعنا هذا عازبا إلا زوجته أنت على كل شيء قدير We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by your beautiful names and attributes to bring us closer together to unite us upon that which blesses, blesses us, Ya Rabbi Ameen to unite us upon that which, which, uh, which pleases you, Ya Rabbi Ameen We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be people of discipline people of tenacity, people of sincerity, people of honesty, Ya Rabbi Ameen We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us closer to all that you love and those that you love and the ones that bring us to that which you love, Ya Rabbi Ameen, Ameen, Ameen Ya Allah, bring healing and tenacity and resilience and justice and freedom and liberation and autonomy and victory to the people of Palestine, Ya Rabbi Ameen. Ya Allah, allow the land of Palestine to be free, the trees of Palestine to be free, the people of Palestine to be free, the women of Palestine to be free, the children of Palestine to be free, and allow our hearts to be free, Ya Rabbi, from that which occupies it and that which limits it from truly connecting to you, Ya Rabbi Ameen. Ya Allah, we ask you to allow us to receive the blessing of Laylatul Qadr, Ya Rabbi Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow our prayer to be sincere, our charity to be sincere, our connection to you to be sincere, and our attempt at sincerity to be sincere, Ya Rabbi Ameen. Ya Allah, give us the strength to endure, Ya Rabbi, the difficulties and the challenges. Allow the Quran, Ya Rabbi, to, th to be the thing that grounds us, to be th the thing that gives us clarity in these moments of difficulty and challenge, Ya Rabbi Ameen. Ya Allah, allow us to continue after Ramadan, not to be from those who worship Ramadan, but from those who worship you, Ya Rabbi Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to continue our fasting of Mondays and Thursdays after Ramadan, Ya Rabbi Ameen. We ask Allah to give us the strength to fast the six days of Shawwal, Ya Rabbi Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to continue to give charity after Ramadan consistently, Ya Rabbi Ameen. To pray at night alone in private when it's just between you and us, Ya Rabbi Ameen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to receive more Ramadans and to come out of this Ramadan having been transformed and having to be changed in the best ways possible, Ya Rabbi Ameen. We thank you, Allah, for all that has been. We thank you for all that has not been. We thank you for all that you've given. We thank you for all that you've withheld. And we thank you for the greatest gift, which is the gift of the Quran and the gift of life and the gift of having the Prophet ﷺ as our Prophet and our Messenger. Jazakumullah khairan.